All right, we should be live right now. If I could ask the people who are in attendance, if you would be so kind as to say whether you can see or hear us right now, because we're all on a new platform that we're uh, sort of trying to figure out. So there's the chat box you can see at the bottom. There are messages on the side. I'd love to know if people can hear us. We're getting hello from Orlando, hello from Arlington, Virginia, greetings from Los Angeles, hello from the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, hello from Atlanta, hello from Boston. So you hear us, but there's an echo. Okay, yes, we can see and hear fine. I'm always so excited when technology works out. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. We're extremely appreciative of people's time. We know these days the last thing anyone wants to do is get on another screen. So we are incredibly appreciative. We are appreciative to the Small small Festival, which is for independent publishing, small books. We are grateful to History Through Fiction, which is the publisher that is sponsoring this event. I am hoping this will be a very interactive event. While the four of us will talk amongst ourselves, what we'd like to do is we'd also like to hear from you. So if you have a question or if you have a comment or you have something you just like to share, please, please, please put it in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on it. I will be reading some things out. We're getting hello from Washington, DC, you know, Seattle. This, this, is, this is wonderful. This is amazing. So thank you again for coming. My name is Alina Adams. I am the author of various books, including Figure Skating Mysteries, which is another topic some of us have in common. And my latest book is The Nesting Dolls. Oh, thank you, Masha. Masha will be acting everything out for us, my, which covers three generations of a family from Odessa, USSR, to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. And my next book will be My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish Autonomous Region, which will be out in November 2022 from History Through Fiction Press. I'm now going to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, Yelena Furman is an academic and fiction writer whose articles, short stories, and book reviews have appeared in various venues. With Olga Zilberberg, she co-runs Punctured Lines, a feminist blog on post-Soviet and diaspora literatures. Masha Rumer is the author of Parenting with an Accent, How Immigrants Honor Their Heritage, Navigate Setbacks, and Chart New Paths for Their Children, The Press, 2021. I was about to say this year, but I guess last year. Um, her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Washington Post, Parents, and Literary Hub, winning awards from the New York Press Association. And Olga Zilgerberg is the author of Like Water and Other Stories, she serves as a co-facilitator of the San Francisco Writers Workshop, and together with Elena Furman, founded Punctured Lines, a feminist blog about post-Soviet literature from within and outside of the former Soviet Union. Something else we're going to be doing throughout the course of this talk is we are going to be putting up links in the chat to charities that we particularly have vetted and support for ways, there's lots of different ways that you can help people affected by the war in Ukraine. So those will also be popping up periodically. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for answering my questions. And I'm going to start with asking each one of you to discuss your connection to the former Soviet Union. I, for instance, was born in Odessa. My family immigrated in 1977. We actually ended up in San Francisco, California. Now um, we live in New York, including my parents who are in Brighton Beach, um, Brooklyn. And I wanted to also ask when the last time you were there was, because in my own case, my mother and I visited in 1988. My, I was working for ABC Sports and I was there in 1995. And then most recently, my husband and our children were there in the summer of 2019 when our older son was doing an internship in Moscow. And each one of those eras was incredibly different. When we visited in 1988, it was just the beginning of Glasnost and Perestroika. When we visited, when I visited in 1995, it was a city trying to figure out and a country trying to find an identity. And in 2019, it felt like it had sort of integrated into Europe and was just another European city. So. I'm curious about your experiences. And again, I'm going to apologetically ask to just go in alphabetical order. So if Yelena, then Masha, then Olga, please tell us about your personal connection to the former Soviet Union and the last time you were there. Um, can, um, everyone, can, everyone, 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 can everyone hear me? 
think there's a bit of an echo, but we'll do yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not quite not sure what to do with that. Can I fix it on my um, end? Is, are you sure that you don't have it, another window open? Sometimes if you have it open in two windows, you get an echo. No, I have one. Right. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't have headphones. Um, well, we'll, we'll we, it's nice. We sound like you're in a cave. It's it's actually, it's, it's fun. Just go ahead. Okay, because it was working before, fine. Um, I was born in Kiev. I We left in the late 1970s. I then went back, back being a relative term, and worked in Moscow for uh, two years um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I've actually not been back for um, quite some time. I was getting ready to go back um, when COVID hit, and then the political situation worsened, and now there's a war, and so I don't think I'm going back to Moscow anytime soon, but I'm hoping to go back to Kiev when it's safe. Masha? Uh, yes. I uh, was born in the, so in the Soviet Union. Sorry, I'm listening to myself with a little bit of a feedback. Um, can you, yeah, so I was born in the Soviet Union in the, uh, Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. Um, I left shortly after the Soviet Union fell. So in 1992, I was an immigrant to the United States. Um, I think just as for a lot of us or most of us here, if not all, I have really strong roots in Ukraine. My grandmothers are from Ukraine. Um, my current family members are from Odessa. My cousin lived there until recently in Kiev uh, and she had to evacuate with her family. So we're all obviously touched by this. Most recently I was back the one and only time in uh, 2004 uh, I haven't been since. Obviously, I was hoping to show my kids the place where I grew up, um, including Ukraine, where I spent a lot of time also as a child, but that will have to be put on hold indefinitely. Olga? Yeah, um, I grew up uh, in, in Leningrad, like like Mash. I was born uh, and grew up in Leningrad and came to the U.S. as a college student in 96. And my family uh, continued to live in, in, uh, <laughs> in St. Petersburg, uh, well, until last month. <laughs> uh, but... Um, you know, it was, it's interesting. I always like to talk about this in American settings. You know, I grew up in a Jewish families and uh, until the revolution, Jewish, fa Jewish families who lived in the Russian empire were not allowed to uh, live in Russia proper, but had to live in the, what what's called the pale of settlement in Ukraine and Belarus and, uh, um, the Baltic re republics were that, the pale of settlement. And so a lot of families, a lot of families, we, 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 um, we, we all came to, like my, my family, all four of my grandparents were born in the pale and came to, uh, to St. Petersburg when other families moved to the West and in the United States. So my husband, for instance, uh, in at the turn of the 20th century, his family came to um, to to um, to uh, Philadelphia, um, and my but when my grandparents' families came to Leningrad, and so when I met my husband, he considered himself a Russian uh, Russian American. But when we started looking at the map, it turned out that he, his family was from Nezhen, which is two hours of, uh, you know, north of Kiev uh, by train. And so we've, uh, you know, uh, so I've never lived in Ukraine myself, but we've traveled there. So I've traveled there several times, both as a young child. And, uh, I, uh, this, I'm going to read today from a story that, that said in a uh, very, very important trip in my life when we went to, I went to Crimea in 2003. Uh, and then, uh, my husband and I traveled in, uh, yeah, Kiev and Ednezhen, uh, in 2011. That was really memorable. And you get off the train and there's a horse with a carriage there. And it's a half an hour walk to town proper from the train station. And it was amazing because 
you know, the, the lifestyle was actually not that far removed from what we could imagine uh, back, you know, a hundred years ago. So, uh, and of course now you see, you know, on the news, you know, like Knezhin has been one of those places that's in the middle of the battlefield. <laughs> Well, you know, I was going to say we should read again in alphabetical order, but since you've already set up, Olga, why don't you start by reading your piece since it leads so beautifully into it and then we'll just go in, in reverse alphabetical order. Okay, sure. Yeah, so the story, uh, the story, you know, the, I, I, it's said circa 2003, uh, but uh, I drafted it in uh, 2011 and then it was published in, uh, in a magazine, it's not in my book, but it's um, it, it was um, in this magazine, Epiphany, um, and it's called The Green Light of Dawn. And I'll just read the beginning of it because it's a long story. The end of August in Crimea was hailed at, as the height of the velvet season. The warm weather held, but most vacationers from the former USSR returned home to work and school and the accommodations were cheap. Boarding the plane in New York, I made two connections in Paris and Kiev and landed at the international airport in Simferopol early morning, two days later. From there, I caught a train to the coast of the Black Sea. I didn't have a firm agenda, except that I eventually had to make it to the top of Mount Aipetri. The train first stopped in Sevastopol, the former Soviet naval headquarters in the Black Sea. Once impossible to enter or exit without a special permit, the city remained a base for both Russia's and Ukraine's navies after the breakup of the Soviet Union. A pack of old men and women surrounded the few arriving passengers right on the platform, offering rooms and entire flats for a few dollars a night. I hesitated, but eventually made a deal with a lean old man, deeply suntanned and wearing a sailor hat. By the time we got to the man's house, I was, I was out of breath and cursing, cursing in English behind his back. Our destination turned out to be a group of lean-tos high up in the hills with an outhouse in the back and no bath or running water. But the window of my room opened onto a panoramic view of the bright blue bay and the sleepy and peaceful looking city, bridal white in the hot sun. The man offered me a thimble full of his home distilled cherry liquor. I paid him for the week, though at the rate he was asking, I could have afforded to stay for months. Sailors of all ranks and nationalities poured onto the boardwalk looking for one night stands. Groups of local teenagers downed bottles of wine and cans of beer and threw them in the water. I had meant to dip my feet in the sea, but changed my mind when I saw all the tin cans collecting at the base of the granite pillar mountain on a rock in the middle of the bay and bearing a bronze double-headed eagle, a monument to the 19th century war. For the, few, for the first few days in Sevastopol, I played tourist, visiting the Grecian ruins and abandoned Soviet military outposts. Towards the end of the week, I began to spend more and more time on a remote beach, and by night would return to my room with a bottle of cheap Crimean wine and some bread and cheese for dinner. I slept a lot and had grotesque sexual dreams. Andre with two penises and large breasts dancing at a club among the gorgeous full-bodied hermaphrodites. I woke up with a huge grin on my face and drool on my pillow then remembered Andrei's body with the sunken cheeks and eyes the way I saw it at the crematorium. After a week of this, I could stand it no longer. I wanted to get Andrei out of my head and so decided to go down the coast and get the tri trip to Aipietri over with as soon as possible. I packed my clothes and boarded the intracity bus. So she, uh, she's She's just lost a friend and she's grieving by going to a place that was dear to him. So the story, it's a pilgrimage uh, story. Masha, please. Okay. Can you hear the echo or is that, can you hear me okay? Because mine it's, has a bit of a feedback. This. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to read is um, not fiction. I do write a little bit of fiction but the way 
my storytelling and processing usually goes is through personal essays, I suppose, and particularly through journalism, since that's my background. Um, and just kind of as a quick preface, since, you know, for over a month now, I've, I've really struggled about with how to, you know, not just how to process, we, we all are, but how to share what, what's basically on my mind night and day. And I figured that the best format to do this right now was through kind of a journalistic storytelling um, with some personal narrative thrown in. So I figured what I'd read from is um, like a, an article that's coming out this coming Monday. So it hasn't been published yet. And it has kind of an overview of the situation basically how the immigrant community, the diaspora community from the former Soviet Union is, you know, responding to the war, how it affects them personally, and also, of course, how they're supporting uh, Ukrainians and Ukraine. So I'll just read a little bit from it. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just, just the part from the article. Since the war began, I've struggled to verbalize what it's like to watch the slaughter of a nation and have no power to stop it, to see images of missiles dropping on the city where my grandmother grew up, to know there is a convoy of armored vehicles approaching the city where my cousin lives. Many of my relatives now and generations earlier are from Ukraine, including both of my grandmothers. I grew up in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg hearing Russian peppered with occasional Yiddish and Ukrainian words. And I immigrated soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Therein lies a particular terror of this war. Many Russian and Ukrainian families are blended or were blended up until now. This is also the case for Irina Clay, who was born in Russia and raised in Odessa, Ukraine. Her cousins are now scattered across both nations. When she learned of the invasion, Clay tells me, she immediately jumped on the phone with relatives overseas. Every day since, she's been helping them plan their escapes and finding them shelter remotely. She just secured a place to stay in Germany for her childhood friend, who fled Odessa with her son and mother-in-law with no time to pack their belongings. It's like reliving immigration all over again, Clay says to me. Yes, I'm in a secure place. I have a job. I have responsibilities. But it's like losing your home again. Some three and a half million refugees have fled Ukraine since the war broke out on February 24th. Not everybody is able to evacuate, however, or wants to. Clay's childhood friend left her husband and father-in-law behind because males between the ages of 18 and 60 are barred from leaving Ukraine in case they're needed for the fight. Many ex-Soviet immigrants are also watching their fraught histories replay before their eyes. Ukrainians and Russians grew up in the shadow of collective trauma in the post-World War II Soviet Union. We were raised on our grandparents' stories about the Nazi seizures and bombings of the evacuating civilians, which is now a reality again. For Ukrainians, the wounds run even deeper. In the 1860s and 70s, the Tsarist regime banned the printing of books and performances of plays in Ukrainian, a ban that lasted until the Soviet Revolution. And then in the 1930s, as Ukrainian culture was flourishing in the Soviet Union, its leading poets, writers, and artists were rounded up and shot in what has come to be known as the executed renaissance. And perhaps most importantly, the war triggers memories of Holodomor, Stalin's genocide by famine of 7 million Ukrainians in the early 1930s. In that interview. It is two countries that live through unimaginable things, as, and the history of it is alive in both, says Sasha, a Bay Area-based software founder who was born in Moscow. His last name is being withheld for the safety of his family. If I were to pick one word, he says, it's shame, deep and paralyzing shame, even though I've lived most of my life in the United States. My country is gone, he says. His family in Russia is active in the anti-war movement, his cousin and his wife have been arrested twice in the past two weeks and prior to the war, too, for participating in anti-Putin demonstrations. 
Sasha has been donating to various relief organizations for Ukrainian refugees. He's also trying to get the engineers at his company out of Russia, where many have bought into state propaganda, he explains, as he refers to the Kremlin shutting down and blocking independent media and social networks and making fake news about the war punishable by up to 15 years in prison. Also, when it comes to identity, there's the fact that millions of Ashkenazi Jews trace their roots to Ukraine, once a home of their forefathers. For generations, the Jewish population of the Russian Empire was forced to live in the Pale of Settlement, as Olga says, um, or parts of modern-day Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Poland, and Lithuania, enduring pogroms and poverty. It was in Ukraine that one out of every four Jewish Holocaust victims was murdered during the Nazi occupation, including my own relatives. After the Holocaust, anti-Semitism comfortably lived on in the Soviet Union. And it says much about how far Ukraine has come since USSR's collapse, that its current president, elected in a landslide victory in 2019, is Jewish. Thank you so much, Masha. Yelena, you were having some trouble with your sound. Is it good now? Uh, can yes. you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I think I actually was in two windows. So, okay, if if I go out, let me know. Um, so this is, uh, I, I had nothing uh, ready or appropriate for um, this event. So this is something I wrote um, for, for this. Um, so, and I will try to get through it without crying or coughing, uh, which I do not guarantee. So can you, are you all still continuing to hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I have no words or too many for watching from the safety of California as people hide in bomb shelters, flee their homes, die from rocket fire. For the fact that these images are reminiscent of the Second World War and that those fleeing from Kiev are likely doing so from the same train station as my grandmother and great grandmother. For the fact that had my family not immigrated in the late 1970s, we would now be deciding whether to shelter or run. The last place we lived was a balloon and a CNN headline, tanks in a balloon, which appeared on my TV early on in the invasion, is not one I ever thought I'd see. Nor those about the destruction of Irpin, where we spent summer vacations. I have no words for watching my birthplace being bombed by a place I loved living in that has turned into a monstrous version of itself. I lived and worked in Moscow in the 90s when it was an economic freefall and absolutely chaotic, but had the air of possibility and hopefulness. And then a few years later, Russia began sliding back into authoritarianism. My thoughts and tears are first and foremost for the citizens of Ukraine. Secondarily, they're for those in Russia. My own loss is metaphorical, one experienced from the distance of the diaspora. The Moscow I knew is gone, and I don't think I will ever see it again. I'm tempted to make a three sisters joke, but nothing is funny anymore. Unlike with Moscow, I don't have much of a connection with Kiev, despite being born there. After we left, I visited a few times. For a while, I still had family and friends there, people who knew me as a child, who told me lots of stories about my own family. I went to our Bologna apartment building, walking around outside. I think the playground was still there and children were playing on it, but perhaps I'm misremembering. Many of those whom we knew in Kiev were uh, subsequently immigrated or passed away. And there are few people we know there now, although of course there are some, and I do whatever the secular version is of praying that they're safe. I was young when we left the Soviet Union, so Kiev is a childhood memory, whereas Moscow is an adult connection. To be sure, had my job been in Kiev, things would be different. But honestly, I've never made much of an effort. My family is Jewish, and in the Soviet Union, Jews were a separate category from Ukrainians, despite the fact that we lived in Ukraine. Jews tended to be Russian speakers, but we weren't, they weren't considered Russian either. You were Jewish and treated as such, which is why so many of us immigrated. When people talk about Ukrainian culture and literature about being Ukrainian, this is no more organically mine than, say, its French equivalent. In the time-honored tradition of two Jews, three opinions, I recognize there are others who feel differently, but my family's experience is all too common. As much as I unequivocally support Ukrainian sovereignty, the history of Ukrainian self-determination is bound up with tragic moments for its Jews. Discussions about Ukrainian history to this day are often sanitized of this. On one of my return visits to Kiev, my roommate and I went to Babi Yar. It's on a park ground, and on the day I was there, there was a father playing soccer with his young son. Babi Yar was a ravine in which over a two-day period in September 1941, more than 33,000 of Kiev Jews were exterminated, killed by the Nazis with local Ukrainian help. 
If the four people who would go on to be my grandparents hadn't been out of the city by then, there would be no one here saying these words. After the war, the party line was that it was the, that it was Soviet victims, not Jews. Now there's an entire Holocaust center built on this site. The center was in the news recently being hit in the shelling of the nearby TV tower by Russian rockets. Five people died, so there was killing there again. There was also a video of people whose family members were exterminated and by Biyar who were now sitting in a Kiev bomb shelter and cursing Putin. I have no words for any of this. It's crucial, of course, to not, allow, to not let our beliefs become calcified. Today's Ukraine, as has been mentioned, has a Jewish president and a former Jewish prime minister. From what I know, it is possible to identify as Ukrainian Jews rather than how, rather than how we think of ourselves, that is, Jews from Ukraine. I can welcome this new Jewish identity, question it, learn about it, and celebrate it. I cannot share it because I left at a time that this identity was impossible. And the changes notwithstanding, there are things today, there are things about today's Ukraine that still make me uncomfortable. But many of us have lived in places that never fully accepted us, yet they were our homes. I made this happen with Russia. And this was by definition true for my family in Ukraine, where we were very much a part of this society for generations, like so many other Jews. <coughs> Sorry. My birthplace has come suddenly back into my life in the most horrific way possible. And now seeing Kiev seems the most urgent. I want to show my son where I'm from, both the famous landmarks and the personally significant places like the Kiev Zoo, where his mother and grandfather spent many Saturdays. And I want to see the new places, including the Babin Yar Holocaust Center, because that's part of his and my heritage too. I will have no words or too many for that as well, but at least we'll be looking for them together. One day he'll find his own words. Until I can physically do my small part to help Ukraine's economy, I will donate, encourage others to do so, and there are many links in the chats to, to do that, and, and share information. And because of what I do for a living, I will continue teaching Russian literature, supporting my students, and showing by all examples available to me that I refuse to let that monster have a monopoly on what Russian means. Since I'm struggling for words, although not for tears, and I'm a researcher by training, I will end with a quote from the statement on the war in Ukraine by scholars of genocide, Nazism, and World War II, which is available on the Jewish Journal's website that says it so well. <coughs> As the signatories say, quote, we do not idealize the Ukrainian state and society. Like any other country, it has right-wing extremists and violent xenophobic groups. Ukraine also ought to better confront the darker chapters of its painful and complicated history. Yet none of this justifies the Russian aggression and the gross mischaracterization of Ukraine. At this fateful moment, we stand united with free, independent, and democratic Ukraine and strongly reject the Russian government's misuse of the history of World War II to justify its own violence, end quote. Ukraine will stand, and I will Jewishly stand with it. Thank you. Well, before I read, I, I was going to have asked a question later, but you set it up so beautifully, Elena, that I want to just go into it, is I've lived in America for over 40 years, and I've spent over 40 years saying to people who say to me, oh, you speak Russian, so you're Russian. I say, no, I was actually born in Odessa. Oh, you were born in Odessa, so you're Ukrainian. <laughs> no, actually, when we lived in Ukraine, um, we were considered Jewish. The infamous fifth line said, I didn't say religion. I always stress this to people. It didn't say religion, it said nationality, Jewish. Yeah. So I have basically spent 40 years explaining this to people and then the world blew up. And as you so beautifully put it, we have to reassess where we stand on that spectrum for lack of a better word. So I'd like to ask Masha or um, Olga whether they'd like to chime in to say how you've been navigating this, this dance across all of the identities. So please, wh whoever. <laughs> Masha, do you want? Um, I mean, I you can. You go. You can go first. I, I, for I'm me, still you know, recovering after that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lynn, that that was so powerful. Both of you, I <laughs> thank you, both of you. That that was that was really wonderful. Uh, and and I love how both of you just express such complex emotions and co the, the complex feelings, and yet unanimous support for Ukraine, of course. Um, the yeah for me um uh i i um 
never been comfortable identifying uh, with Russian just because I'm Jewish, I'm not Russian. <laughs> and in Russia, I was very much made feel that. And in part, honestly, I am in, in the US, even, even though I left after, after the fall of the Soviet Union, but ve it's, I very much feel that I left because I was Jewish. And, um, and uh, so I've, I've always tried to push my identification towards the city. I grew up in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and I live in San Francisco or wherever, you know, and that's, that's you know, that's been my default, you know, for, for many years. Um, uh, I, yeah, identifying with nation states has never <laughs> felt comfortable. <laughs> but I also, I also, if I, if I'm, you know, in, in other contexts, I do also say that I was born in the USSR because that defines it too. And Ukraine and Russia were part of the USSR. And it is, it is infuriating to think that, you know, how many people, I mean, Yes, Ukraine was a part of the same country as the USSR, and now it is a different country, right? How, how hard is that to, to, to understand? It is a different country. Nasha? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just processing what you all are saying uh, and agreeing. I, I, in terms of self-identification, I mean, there's like, multiple <laughs> chapters in this book talking about this basically in my experiences and other people's experiences um and in addition to ukraine there's also of course like people from moldova <laughs> people from belarus where my half of my other half of my family comes <laughs> from like and we're all called russian right because that is a language we speak. That is what was written on the ruble bills, right? And like 15 <laughs> languages and like solidarity of all workers unite. And, but I've never been able to really self-identify. I'd have to probably agree with Olga. I usually said I'm Russian because I was born in Russia. And, but St. Petersburg to me is a very unique and special place. I should also say that in addition to sharing like uh, history and probably all of us here having some common connections back in the pale of settlement with our ancestors <laughs> olga and i apparently were neighbors in saint petersburg not only that but her brother and and i studied piano with the same teacher <laughs> at a music school which we just discovered recently um but it always changes for me when I go to, say, Europe and like an older Italian gentleman asks me where I'm from. I used to say I'm from New York or or actually, sorry, I say I'm from Petersburg because that's what he would know. When I would talk to some people who were younger, like my age, I would say I'm from New York because that was at the time activated in that situation. I think it's a very Jewish experience since we're in so many ways like a migratory people that have settled and wherever we were not being pushed out of. Um, but obviously, like all of us here, I have, you know, I'm part Ukrainian and uh, I stand in solidarity with Ukraine and I'm horrified by what the Russia's government is doing to it. Actually, if I may just read one little bit from my book um, about this, you know what, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll find it later, um, sorry. Well, we'll, we'll come yeah. back. Welcome yeah. back. Good. Thank you. You know what? I, again, Olga, you set this up so beautifully when you were talking about cities versus nation states. To me, having been born in Odessa, my identity is much more tied to Odessa than it is to Ukraine. I even remember as a child living in Odessa thinking, oh, the people who live in Lvov or Kharkov, they're Ukrainians. But Odessa <laughs> is its own thing. And I actually even made a metaphor with it because my husband is a lifelong born and bred New Yorker. And I mean, he he's pretty sure there's probably other places outside New York, but why really test that theory um, too much? So, and I think it's very similar in that just like New Yorkers are kind of, they identify as New Yorkers, yeah before they identify as anything else. I think Odysseus identify with Odessa before they identify with the larger piece. I was actually speaking to my parents a few hours ago who said the words, oh, Odessa is only being shot by rockets. It's not being bombed. And the rockets are coming from ships, so it's not that bad, which sort of shows how we're 
we're looking at things. So what I'd actually like to do is read a piece from uh, my novel, The Nesting Dolls, which shows how when I set to write a book that was set in the former Soviet Union, it had to be Odessa and Odessa had to be a character. So this is from chapter one, so it doesn't really need much setup, but you will see how sort of Odessa bleeds its way through everything. Signing the marriage license brisked by so quickly Daria missed the exact moment when she moved from 17-year-old girl to married woman. One minute she was standing between her mother and her groom at the shabby Zach's office in front of an official stamping the couples through. The next she was kissing Edward, being kissed by mama, receiving an embrace from Edward's papa, and it was over. As Isaac Izraelovich declared how delighted he was to have Daria for a daughter, mama scrutinized the license she snatched from the official's hands, making certain Daria had done as instructed and signed her new legal name as Daria Gordon, not the Dvora Kaganovich she'd been registered at birth. Come with us back to the house, Edward urged his new mother-in-law as they were ushered toward the door past the line of couples waiting their turn to wed. We have friends dropping by to celebrate. Niet, niet, mama stammered, first instinctively in Yiddish, then forcing herself to switch to Russian. When laws were changed seven years earlier, mandating all Soviet children were now required to attend secular schools, Daria's mother had overruled her husband's edict that girls belonged at home. In their ramshackle shtetl of Valta, old men wept into their beards about all boy rabbi-led headers replaced by a co-ed Yiddish learning language school co teaching communist ideology. But that wasn't good enough for Mama. She dragged her daughter away from her friends, who Mama pronounced provincial, to a school in the neighboring village. Let others limit their future by clinging to Yiddish. Mama's only child would learn Russian and have the entire world at her feet. Mama lectured it didn't matter if Daria's fellow pupils were the same grubby Ukrainian hooligans who came to Valta each Easter to throw rocks and howl how she did killed Christian children and use their blood to bake matzah. They were living in modern times and Daria would be a modern woman. Stop bawling and do what your mother tells you. As soon as Daria had absorbed an acceptable amount of Russian, Mama dictated a letter to Comrade Stalin, which Daria translated and subscribed, thanking him for this opportunity he'd granted them. Mama's next stop was pushing Daria to speak Russian without those back of the tongue rolled R's Daria's teacher had thoughtfully encouraged the other children to laugh at until Daria exercised her la last telltale bit of Yiddishkeit. The same, however, did not apply to Mama. Her Russian stalled at the level of a child. Nonetheless, she refused to speak Yiddish to the worldly Gordons. Mama demurred at their invitation to join the celebratory supper. I do not wish to cause trouble. I must not embarrass you in front of your friends. She ducked her head as if her mere provincial proximity might somehow tarnish them. You wouldn't embarrass us, Mama. Daria looked to Edward and his father for support. They dutifully echoed Daria's denial, even as their furtive glances told her otherwise. Do what your husband tells you. Mama severed the reins she'd held tightly over her daughter for 17 years. And everything will be well, my Daria. Mama had been so eager for Daria to begin her new life, she'd insisted her daughter bring her solitary travel bag to the Zax. Is Isaac Izraelovich carried it for Daria. Edward must protect his fingers, he explained unnecessarily, as all around them, placards proclaimed Edward Gordon's upcoming piano concert at the Odessa Opera House. It had been those posters, still wet from paste, that inspired Mama to effectuate a match between her raven-haired, ebony-eyed, voluptuous girl and the dark, tall, dark, handsome, and accomplished Edward Gordon. They'd come to Odessa from Valta specifically to land a fellow worthy of Mama's treasure. Since the repeal of the new economic policy, NEP, allowing individuals to own small businesses, Mama pronounced the shopkeeper a man with no future. She said the same about the clerks and local government administrators who'd expressed interest in Daria. Mama knew a Jewish boy could rise only so far in politics, no matter how shrewd, ambitious, enterprising, or dynamic especially if they were shrewd, ambitious, enterprising, and dynamic. Men are to be tortured, Mama had instructed Daria as they stood outside the opera house late one March evening at the cross streets of Lastichkina and Menina, across from the towering arch doorway topped by a golden balcony surrounded by two pairs of Roman columns. There was a decorative level even higher than that, framed by gold statues, the most prominent of which was a topless woman on a half shell, one arm raised in salutation, the other embracing a torch while trying to ride three panthers taking off in different directions. 
Two more statues, marble this time, flank the stairs leading up to the front entrance, representing comedy, tragedy, muses, operas, and ballets. While the woman up top was half naked, the figure below was wrapped in flurries of marble cloth. Daria wondered if any of them were cold. Daria certainly was cold. March in Odessa could be windy and inhospitable to standing around this close to midnight, wearing a virginal white dress that demurely draped down to Daria's ankles and up to her chin, yet was so tightly fitted above the waist that shivering was out of the question. She'd burst right through. We can't torture Edward Gordon, Mama, if he can't see us. He's in there. We're out here. On the stage, he doesn't live. He will need to exit eventually. Music lovers streamed out of the opera house, buttoning coats, wrapping scarves around their necks, and pulling on gloves Daria envied from afar. Mama hooked her elbow through Daria's and pulled her around the crescent moon shape of the opera house towards the rear exit along Teatralny Lane. And there he was, Edward Gordon, in the flesh. Edward noticed her and smiled. Daria started to smile back, which was when her mother gave Daria's arm a firm tug, redirecting her trajectory away from Edward. Instead of stopping, they walked blithely past him and his entourage, Mama looking straight ahead, making it clear Daria had best do the same. They continued walking until they'd rounded the corner and were back at the front entrance, blending into the crowd of exiting citizens. Daria threw both arms to the sides, dress be damned. I thought we were here to meet Edward Gordon. What are we supposed to do now? Now, her mother said, we go home. Home was Moldavanka, part suburb, part ghetto along the city's northern rim. It was a one-time Moldovan colony that by the turn of the century had expanded to house nearly 70,000 of Odessa's poorest Jews. They came to work in factories as laborers, as tailors, and as buyers of secondhand clothes. They stayed because laboring in factories, tailoring, and selling secondhand clothes didn't pay much. Mama made it clear she and Daria were just passing through. Mama had no intention of settling down amid squalor that looked like a fire had recently crumbled entire blocks. They rented a room on the top floor of a house otherwise occupied by a bearded Jew who still clung to old world nonsense and his wife who spent her days trying to disguise that. The room was barely large enough for the single bed it came with. They dragged it against the wall to give themselves a sliver of space for the chest of drawers, on top of which stood a basin to wash in. The height of the bed made opening the middle drawer impossible. If they wished to reach the one below, they had to wriggle along the floor until lay face, lay face to face with the chamber pot. Their landlord asserted there was no space for a coal stove. His concession had been to sell Daria and her mother a pair of threadbare rugs they could hang on the walls to keep out the cold. As she and Mama undressed in the dark, scurrying under the blankets, Daria whispered, if you wanted me to meet Edward Isakovich, why didn't you let me speak to him? He wanted to speak to me, I could tell. Men disdain easy woman. We will make him work so he understands your value. So that is, as you can see, it's it's a love story to Odessa as well as to, to the story in The Nesting Dolls. So actually my next question to change uh, tax a little bit is, we're writers. Our stock in trade is words. What use are words right now? <laughs> Again, to, to anyone, but this is something I've been wrestling with for the last month. Words, I'm very good at words. I can write many words and people can put them in a book, but what good are words right now to anyone? So please. I can jump in. <laughs> um, I mean, there is absolutely, um, that that question and also um i very much uh do fiction writing as as you uh, alina and uh lena ha and and i know masha i think you don't do fiction but uh in in I, i'm not sure if you've done but 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 as a fiction writer i feel like i can't i can't write reactionary stuff right i can't read Fiction takes a long time to germinate. I've been working on a novel. My first novel, I've been trying to get it off the ground for two years now. And, uh, and um, you know, I can't, it, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, that, that's not the kind of writing that's needed or necessary at the moment. And yet it is needed and necessary. Um, so that's that's very much the dilemma. So you know when um, you know when when I uh, when the the war started and had 24th of February happened to me my, my birthday and I I, I um, you know I 
had uh, I, anyway, I wrote a big Facebook post and which I then turned into an essay. And it's so that's directly in response to the war. So I switched to a different kind of writing. And, you know, because of Lena and Lena can maybe talk more about the blog that we've been doing, we've been able to do a few organizing things to help Ukraine immediately, you know, sharing calls for donations and big part of what we've been doing. Uh, but yeah, Lena can talk about m more about that. But but for me, it's it's you know I can help some, but I also need to continue doing my job, which is different. So it's 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 a yeah, it's a big question. I'm and I'm glad you're asking it. Masha, you. Look I, like I guess I can <laughs> jump in. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I keep hearing feedback so um it's very hard to say I, I think i also i very much agree with what olga said and just to the, the point that yelena was making saying beginning this like mind-blowing essay with i have no words it's not really about me but then boom like there it comes there are words and it is directly about you right and it's <laughs> And it's so powerful and moving. I mean, we're all experiencing this in different ways. Um, I think that it, it just depends on, I suppose, what kind of writing we're talking about. There is a writing that can be writing that's kind of, you know, perhaps an act of service uh, that's meant to inform, educate, and let people share, you know, information and express themselves, which is one of the reasons I've been trying to write, particularly doing interviews and this piece that's coming out next uh, Monday, because I think there's a lot of misperception of what's actually going on um, in the piece I'm saying that one of the people I've interviewed used to be asked, like, is Ukraine in Africa in America? Like, people well, need if, to know if, what's if happening may, in Ukraine. If I may, my my son, yeah. who, as I said, he, my son spent a year living in Moldova studying Russian, and then he spent a summer of 2019 on an internship in Moscow. And as he said to me the last time I spoke to him, it's amazing how many people have opinions on a country they can't even find on a map. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, sadly, that's the case. And <laughs> That's why so many people right now, or up until now, from the former Soviet Union used to say, oh, maybe I'm Russian, or maybe somebody would say, are you Russian? They'd be like, finally, begrudgingly, okay, fine, fine, even though <laughs> yes. they're not. Okay, because sure, you, you, fine, whatever you say. That's right. what I just, Or let me sit down with you and explain this fraught history of my ancestors and, and everything else. Um, but it's incredibly important to right now tell people that just because somebody speaks Russian, they're not all from Russia. And in fact, there is a really painful, there are really painful chapters in the history of the former Soviet Union. I mean, not just to, with the suppression of Ukrainian language and culture, and you know, I would say even all languages of the former Soviet Union, but also the fact that you know Stalin made a pact with Hitler to invade like the the Baltic former, you know, republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, which were, again, sovereign nations right before. And then they were like forced to speak Russian and made part of the Soviet empire. Uh, it's incredibly important to elucidate that. Um, and also to share the fact that just because somebody was born in Russia or the former Soviet Union, I'd recommend watching this clip with Mila Kunis, who, an actress that who was in a recent interview, was saying that like, she used to say she's Russian too, but in fact, she, she is Ukrainian. She was born in Ukraine. She's a Jew. That Sorry, where was I going with this? I'm, I'm just feeling a little overwhelmed right now. Um, yeah, that we don't all, we don't, we don't support Putin's actions. Just because somebody was born there, the fact that they immigrated means that they have, they reject the policies of the former Soviet Union. They reject the policies that are currently happening there. And they in no way support the war. Um, I guess it's also an attempt to try to say that just because somebody hears Russian, that person is not an enemy. They, they are just as mortified and that they have family in Ukraine probably or family from Ukraine at some point. So, and, and so that's really quick thing to add. And the other point, I guess, is just to, to express and process. Uh, I will bring an example of Cheryl Strait who wrote Wild. Um, I forgot exactly how many years it was. I think maybe eight, although I might be incorrect. 
after she had this uh, journey when she went to the Pacific Crest Trail um, on the West Coast and processed so much of trauma that she's carried for years before. She didn't write the story about this right away in a best-selling book. Um, it took her years to understand first what she wants to actually say with it and what she wants to do with it. So there's, so it depends on what one is writing and um, it just takes time to understand. Elena? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think you've all said it so eloquently. I'm not sure what else there's to add. I keep thinking, um, uh, you know, there, there's that sort of question that's been asked. You know, how can um, how can anyone write after Auschwitz, right? Like after the the war, like after that, and and the consensus is. Um, um, and Joseph Brodsky actually talked about this in his Nobel speech, but you know, it's it's broader than that, right? That not only should you write after Auschwitz, but but you have to write after Auschwitz um, because you can't let that part perish. Um, you know, so many people perished, right? But but um, I don't know. This is not terribly coherent, but but I do agree. Um, you know that right now, I think. I mean, I haven't been able to write anything, but that's also partially because, you know, as mundane as, as this is to say, this is the the sort of end of academic term and no writing gets done at all, regardless of whether they're right. And now there's um, the, this war and I think we're all processing it. I think there's, I'm in absolute awe of everyone who has been able to, like Masha with your story, your, your article coming out and everyone who's written op-eds and Olga with your piece, right? Like everyone who's been able to write through this I have not. Um, in fact, I've said, no, like, I can't do this, you know. Um, I, I don't think that's terribly helpful, but, you know, I think we're all processing it. And, and um, so I think I agree there's different kinds of writing and we need to speak out and, you know, I, we, we need to write the articles and the op-eds. But we also, as Olga said, need to do our jobs and, and whatever it is that we're, we're writing, right? Those, those two things don't have to exclude each other. At least I'm really hoping not. Um, because so so much of about um, you know this this war that that uh, Putin started is so much about his worldview is so monolithic and one and you know there's no hybridity or or anything allowed and and I'm really trying to fight against that and saying you know it's life is all about this um, multiplicity and and various things rather than you know one you know this this black and white kind of thing. Oh, okay. There's a comment um, from Leah Zelterman, which says there's so much hasty, ill thought and reactionary writing yes. makes the need for strong, meaningful <laughs> words even more important, which actually ties into a question I was going to ask right even before Leah typed that is you said talking about after Auschwitz, but we're not after Auschwitz right now. Yeah. We're in the fog of war. Yeah. For, for lack yeah. of a cliche. So that's my, that was going to be my question. How do you write about something where it's not after, where the gates yeah. of Auschwitz have been opened and we've seen what can be done? And as Masha, you talked about the author who took her time to process. Most writing, especially if you want it to be more than surface, more than glib, needs time to process, but we're in the middle of it. So how do you write from the eye of the storm rather than from the outskirts? Um. If I may also jump in, Alina, yes, exactly. It, it's such an amazing question, Leah. I completely agree with you. Um, I think it's it, it just depends on what one, one feels is, is their calling. I, I think it's important to write as a way to process for anybody at any time as much as possible or, or as, even if it's just a tiny bit. Um, but even if we do have other responsibilities, that actually brings me to a recent uh, Twitter thread we had. Um, uh, Purim, a, a Jewish holiday, had to like happen to fall right in the mm -hmm. middle of all of these bombings, and some of us were like amazing, uh, including one commenter here, trying to you know <laughs> preserve the history of their Soviet identity and the Jewish identity, and try to make these hamantashen. A lot of us were saying they feel like they can't do anything because they're completely consumed by what's happening and we can't process it. Like one of us, I think like I bought like frozen dough like a day late and made something that like unfolded on all these contents of the jam like spewed out. It was really disgusting. I took pictures of the four that, that turned out. But our kids and our, you know, day, like day, you know, responsibilities need us too. But writing is, is critical for processing. And I think it's very individual what we can do. One other thing is writing is also incredibly important to understanding where we stand and how it affects us too. 
um, especially as this is happening. Um, one thing I'll bring up is for me, I've been incredibly like just blown away by trying to revisit the history of my family in the former Soviet Union. The fact that I'm trying to hide, for example, I just learned in the past few years that my my aunt, my great aunt was a prisoner of war. Um, she was taken away by the Nazis when she was digging ditches around Leningrad to try to protect it. Um, even though her father ended up surviving the blockade of Leningrad and she was taken as a prisoner of war. And when she came out, she was taken to the Gulag by Stalin uh, uh, until he died, basically. And she never married, she never had kids. We used to visit her in her one room communal apartment in the center of St. Petersburg. So again, everybody would be, could be considered an enemy in the former Soviet Union. And just because one lives in Russia doesn't make them an enemy or comes from Russia. And I learned just yesterday that my grandfather's, my other grandfather's strange last name is because he changed it when he went to, when he was called to serve in World War II, because he knew if he were, God forbid, to be caught by the Nazis, his family, and he would be put in the gulag later for foreseeing how the West lives and being a traitor of the state for being a prisoner of war, his family could have suffered. So he changed his last name. So his family in Belarus would not suffer. So it just tells you how complicated it is. And I think dealing with those feelings and experiences of family history incredibly is incredibly important and times like these make it particularly poignant um and cathartic and therapeutic and important for honor and for our identities and, and preserving history for our families and generations to come it's it's very interesting that you actually mentioned that particular story the book that i have coming out actually it does address the fact that soviet soldiers who were taken prisoner during world war ii and some of them ended up in camps that had both americans and soviets in them and some of them worked together especially because the soviets were not signatories to the geneva convention as a result soviets in uh, prisoner of war camps were treated much worse than english and american prisoners and american and english prisoners would try to get food over to the soviet side so they worked together and some of the Soviet soldiers were arrested for collaborating with the enemies and sent to the gulags. That's actually a yeah. story that features as a plot point in my upcoming book. And that's another piece of history that people don't know. People in their own families didn't know about it. You, you just said you didn't know about it until a few years ago. That's the kind of thing that was going on. Yeah. So um, um, did you want to chime in? Oh, I just the, to add to that story. I was one part of my my family's uh, story is that my grandfather was also a prisoner of war in the German in the German uh, camp, and then when he returned to the USSR, he was he was forever afraid of being rearrested. So part of his story is hiding in the you know trying to hide in the Soviet Union. The 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 story that uh, the the. Uh, the, the fact that he had been a prisoner of war. Uh, but I was also going to add one more piece about th this, this great question about like, you know, what can I, you know, how to write in the middle of war. And I mean, for the, I have two parts of the answer, but just that, you know, first it's really important to, you know, to understand, to, to remember, right, to start from like, what can I contribute? What is my position and my audience? Who's my audience? Right. Um, and, and, and what is the story, right? I'm not a like I'm not a journalist. I'm not going to be able to write well in response to to a particular news new or I can't I can't cover news. I can't cover you know I can't cover the stuff that's coming out immediately. But I do have something to contribute and some what we you know we have to contribute. There there are some black and white stories that are out there that's you know we need to help Ukraine. That that's that's a pretty clear story, right? Uh, this story I think is being covered very well, right? There are some more complicated stories, for instance, that we need to help Russians who are escaping Russia right now, and that's a hard story to write and I've been mulling around on how to do it and I see other people are, are, are jumping on that and doing that um, really well I think our friend Sasha Sasha Vesiluk is doing a really good job um, writing towards that but um, 
it's it's a it's a more complicated story and yet it's also true people who are escaping russia right now are need to be considered refugees they are refugees they're dropping everything to leave the country and it is a form of protest leaving a country is a form of protest and and um and also that their lives are in danger in russia in many different ways or uh, russia is about to you know russia is you know since a lot of employers left you know, if you are, say, in IT and you get, you know, if you lost your job, uh, Russian government is becoming the main source of employment. So, um, you know, so people who don't leave become, you know, uh, find themselves in a really uh, tr tricky positions, so, you know, where, you know, anyway, people, people, people who don't want to potentially even consider collaborating with the Russian government. They, they leave. Yeah. There are many reasons to be leaving right, Russia right now. And all of them, are, you know, I think, well, maybe not all of them, but most of them are very good reasons. And in any case, they, they you know, so that's, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, I haven't fully written towards that, but that's something I'm considering, but uh, and the other thing is that you know if we can't you know if while I'm thinking about my my stories, I can always amplify others, and that's another part important part of the job. But there's a lot of really really wonderful writing coming out of Ukraine right now, and and uh, that's something that you know we can do with our blog or just personally on like social media pages. Like uh, there's some really really wonderful uh, write, writers and voices uh, out there, and that's. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's that's. I think that's a very worthwhile thing to do. Yeah. The, the, one thing, if I may, just quickly add. I, I know that's where I'll stop after this. Uh, Olga, what you said is incredibly important. There are so many people that are again being silenced in Russia. They are afraid to speak out, or they do speak out. And in my case, they they got arrested for mm -hmm. protesting and going to, you know, protesting the mm -hmm. uh, the invasion. Um, and some people are not, cannot protest, protest. For example, I have friends who do not support the war. Running, they're running out of medication. Um, a friend's mother is no longer is going to have access to like a medical device that she needs to stay alive. Not because she invaded Putin, and she did not elect him either because the elections were stolen. But these people, obviously, they're not the prime target right now of, of discussion because their country is not getting bombed. Ukraine is. But it is a story that will need to be told later, how people within this, you know, behind this new Iron Curtain are being impacted. And again, we're not ready to tell that story and the focus should definitely, at least for me, should be on Ukraine. But it will need to be told later and how, how much suffering is happening because of Russia's policies and its own people and destroying its own people. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if, if I could just quickly jump in. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Of course, the story right now is Ukraine. When you're being bombed, this takes precedence over absolutely yeah. everything. Um, and you're right, though, that there is other there are other stories also. Um, the, the Russian protesters, the rest the people who are leaving. Um, and again, I know I keep saying this, but this, this really keeps bringing, I've, I've had this discussion recently, and so I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this, but this is something I've always thought my entire life, that those of us who are sort of on the the borderlands or the margins or, you know, have, have different parts of you in different cultures, right, that, that it is... Um, it, incumbent upon it, right? Because bombs aren't falling on us. We're in the diaspora. Um, and Nadina, you, you brought up that point. And I think, but I think because, uh, you know, it's hard to be nuanced when bombs are falling on you. You should not have to be nuanced. It's, it's very black and white. When we are in the safety of our respective homes, I think it's incumbent upon those of us who are in that safety zone to, to be nuanced and to tell the multiple stories, um, particularly, as I said, and, and Masha, you, you brought up how, at least until now, um, you know, there's so many um, uh, families that have Russian and Ukrainian, right, that they're intermixed. Um, and, and you know, I, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this, but but just sort of that, that we keep sight of all the stories. And obviously we know which one to prioritize, that that's clear. I, no one's saying anything otherwise. Yeah. 
Um, but you're right, there are other stories that need to be told. There are also the story as you're telling it, as other people are telling it, of the diaspora, which is very, again, we're in the safety, we're, right? But a lot of us have family there or friends there. And even if we don't, we're still connected to the places and we're from there. And we, there is also a story about the diaspora, which has been hit so hard by this, um, you know, I mean, every refugee crisis, every, every war, right? But this one so particular because it strikes home um, just to so many of us. Which actually brings me to the fact that everybody wants to help and there's so many areas in which people need help. So what I'd like to end this conversation with everyone mentioning a one particular um, charity or organization that they think is doing particularly necessary and useful work. Um, what I'd like to start with is I am a member of UJA, United Jewish Appeal. I sit on a committee there. Last couple of weeks, I've been in several meetings with people who are working on the ground in Ukraine. They're doing everything for piling planes full of donations of medical supplies and food and everything else to bring it to the border. And they're working on a three-pronged plan, at least as it was explained to me from someone who had come back from being there, is first, they're working on delivering food and medical supplies, everything from insulin to other things, to people who have chosen not to go or people who are internally displaced, who may have left their homes but have not left the Ukraine. So a part of it is delivering food and medicine to people who have stayed in Ukraine. A second piece of it is they are at the border. They are physically at the border in Poland. They are physically at the border in Moldova. I believe they're in Hungary, wherever they can be to meet people who are arriving. They are setting up tents. They are distributing food. I was told that they're trying to get people deeper into Poland, into Warsaw, into Krakow, where there is housing available, but a lot of people do not want to leave. A lot of people are staying at the border because they're either waiting for other relatives or they're waiting to see if they can go back. So there are tent cities being set up at the border. And the third piece is for those Jews who wish to immigrate, they are um, facilitating their moving to Israel. But one of the questions that I had, and it's a question I've heard a lot, is are they only helping Jews? And the answer is absolutely not. I've, I've asked this question in many different ways of many different people. And everyone said that the official line from the top, right from the head of UJA, is you are to help everyone who needs help. That Jews know what it means to be asked, oh, you get sorted over to this side, you get sorted over to that side. They are definitely not going to do that. And they are on the ground with, as they said, a lot of other organizations, they said, there's an Israeli flag flying right next to a Turkish flag, and they're both operating a field hospital together. So that's what's going on at the border. And so um, the reason I mention this is because, as again, I've been quoting my son a lot, but he's the one who's been actually very heavily in, involved in Eastern European. He said, watch out for sketchy charities on the internet. Understand you're buying townhouses in London. So, so people are not buying townhouses in London. I'm talking about charities that I know who they are, and I know that the money's going not to overhead, but directly to help. And that's, so my recommendation is UJA and the link is there. And please, each one of you mention a one that you particularly feel strongly about. So. Um, I can mention one, it's, since it's on the top of the list, it's a, called Cash for Refugees. It was founded, co-founded by Friends of Friends. I actually just interviewed them for the story that's coming out on Monday. Um, it's by former Soviet immigrants uh, living in the United States, I believe Boston, and also in San Francisco. They pooled their own money and did fundraising, and they basically fly to the points of entry of the refugees. I know most recently in Romania, one of the co-founders like left his wife and, and kids at home and flew for a week to Romania, and he, like, with $200,000, and he gave out cash uh, around $90 equivalent in Romanian currency to every family that crosses so that the money can get to them directly uh, without overhead um, and they can use that for transportation, clothes, um, lodging, anything that they need, especially since it's hard to like convert and, and to local currency. And what do they even have since they just left without anything? So I know for sure I vetted them and it's a good cause. I'll... Um 
I want to add one more charity <laughs> that that came up since we've organized the, this meeting. Uh, this is somebody. This is a translator, um, Annie Fisher, who is you know we we know her very well. Um, she's helping uh, Natalia Pavluk, a Ukrainian translator and the head of the translators organization in Ukraine, to um, help. Um, fund or uh, just give, just give money to to translators and interpreters in Ukraine. A lot of them are doing um, uh, now pro bono work, uh, and a lot of them, uh, literary translators, for instance, all of their uh, income sources have dried up. Nobody's publishing books right now, so she's doing a really good job. Uh, of of um, distributing money directly to the to to translators and interpreters, and this is this is a you know this is very much a direct funding campaign. Um, but 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 um, I think you know, and then this is also like people you know through pe people we know. So in, and there where we're we're I'm hoping that we can do a follow up post on how how the money is being used as well. Uh, but yeah. A really good cause. Yeah, I'm just just a second. What Olga said. Thank you, Olga, for putting that link. I know. Thank you for for organizing this post for Puncture Lines while I was completely useless um, in trying to finish out the term. Um, but so yes, there's that. I don't know that I can. Um, even single out uh, a charity that I, you know, like I know I don't sit on any committees and, and I've sort of been giving, I've given to several. Um, I've seen people sort of, there's GoFundMes, there's um, the links that are up there. Um, I think I sent in one, I can't quite see where it is, but I know he asks, um, it, it's It's right there. It's the second one okay. from the bottom in the second box. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is the Jewish organization, Jewish refugee organization that resettled us as Jewish immigrants when we came to the, the United States um, and really helped out, um, you know, the, the third wave, fourth wave of Jews. And now they, they are, of course, um, helping Ukraine. Um, I've given to them before. I, you know, I, so, I mean, I think I can vouch for them. But I also wanted to, again, I don't have any personal links to it, but I know I've seen this in lists of people that I trust. There's one, I think it's the voices one, um, voices.org. It's voices.org. It's, it's the bottom yeah. of the first box. Yep. Yeah. It's um, the, it was, um, well, it's for children of the um, Donbass who, who were traumatized by, by war. It's, it's mm -hmm. sort of psychological services, art therapy, that, that sort of thing. And they were the first organization that I gave to um I, I'm not normally a kids person, but um, this was, I, I keep thinking about all the children, um, the children who have died, and also the children who are so traumatized by this. Um, maybe it's because I'm going back and I was a child in Ukraine, and also because I have a child now who's 10. Um, and, you know, every time I, when, when war broke out and I, I kissed him goodnight, um, I imagined parents being, you know, in the bomb shelter with their children, putting them to bed, and there he was in his warm, comfortable bed, and you know. Um, so anyway, I, I've been really looking out for for organizations to support um, children, and I know that this this is um, obviously centered on the Donbas, where war has been um, going on for eight years. But I, you know, we know that there's now going to be a lot of very traumatized children um, because of what's happening now. So I think. Um, Again, I, I urge people to support that organization, but also to look for, um, you know, others, right? Other refugee children and children who have stayed behind in, in Ukraine. This is just something unimaginable um, to me to, to have a childhood of, of the, you know, it's a war childhood. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone who attended. Thank you for coming to listen to us. Thank you for coming to listen to us, trying to put our own thoughts together. I don't know if the rest of you are writers like this, but it's like, how do I know what I think until I've written it down and I've read it? It's um, So thank you for coming. Thank you so much for supporting. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Masha, for participating in this. I, I have a feeling that we might be doing this again at some point um, as the situation moves on. Thank you to the Small Festival for, for hosting us. Thank you to History Through Fiction. If anyone has any organizations they'd like to recommend, please put them in the chat, um, which people should be able to see. And once again, you know, for the last two years, I've been ending everything with telling people to just stay well. 
and then everything will sort of work itself out. But I, I don't think it's quite that easy this time. But thank you, everyone, for your support. And thank you for your community. And thank you for your companionship. And we really appreciate you. So have a, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, Alina, for organizing this. Thank you so much. Thank you, so Alina, have, for organizing and other, um, and, uh, some other um, links coming up just so people can see Ukraine trustchain.org. So I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep the screen open for a little bit for a few more minutes in case people have other organizations they'd like to add. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Once again, stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.